And especially on the internet, because it's an anonymous community and no one physically knows that you're a good person, um, people judge you kind of by your deeds. So the whole idea of being reciprocal, always giving back. If you're a famous person for mainstream media, if you're the Paris Hilton, and you're just, you know, everyone, or you're Mick Jagger, everyone knows who you are, but on the, in the internet, no one knows who you are. So you're judged by your good deeds. Also, friends of friends will look when you do a good deed for their friend. So people, they really do pay attention to what's going on. And you can't kind of get too filled, too hot on your own air. So the idea, if you could walk away from this panel with one thing, if you could be reciprocal, be useful, be helpful to others, help other people get their starts or get to where they're going. Um, give, if you're a writer, give tips, uh, open doors for people. But when you do those sorts of things, you kind of, you also start to get a reputation as a go-to person. That's also another way of kind of building a power online. So actually, online is one of the few unique, unique environments where if you're a good guy, you actually do get ahead over the long term. Thanks. <laughs> OK, um, this is a bit, uh, this is me this morning actually on the uh, L train, uh, <laughs> which took forever. That's me waiting in the corner. Um, it takes a great deal of time. And it, when I'm saying time, it's not just a matter of hours per day, but also being consistent and being into it for the long term. I got into the top thousand diggers sometime earlier this year. It took me three to four hours per day over three to four months of time to get into it. And it's also, the time wasn't just digging other people's stories and submitting stories, but it was also reverse engineering dig to figure out what makes a good story that could get on the front page of dig. Um, it, it's spending the time to chat with other people, find out what they're interested in. It's also doing reciprocal work. But if you want to be famous on the internet, it, be honest about it. You're going to spend a lot of time always self-promoting it. Now, this idea actually isn't very new because sometimes you can have a successful artist who's very talented, very good, but they never go out to the parties, they never get to the gallery openings. So you have to kind of think of yourself like Andy Warhol. Uh, you have to constantly be promoting yourself. Always have a new project in the pipe. Always have something new to talk about. Also, help other artists and other people come up. But that takes a huge investment of time. I mean, everyone wants to sit at home in their garret and paint, you know, write the next American novel. But you have to consistently bank that time. It's almost like your marketing time. So you have to spend time reading what other people are writing. You have to spend time tweeting information out. So, but be prepared to spend if you're really hardcore about it. You know, and, if, and by the way, see, there are no shortcuts. If you look on Twitter, you'll always see these scams of get a thousand users overnight. Those are always going to be junk users, and it's better to have 50 people who are really into what you're doing than 5,000 who don't care what you're doing at all. So that takes a great deal of time to earn those people's trust. To also, if you're going to disseminate information or content, that also takes time. But that investment, be prepared to kill like two to three hours per day easily, and that's just to kind of scrape the surface. Okay, next. Um, this actually goes to a good point. A follower account just doesn't. Mean, hey, that's me. <laughs> a follower account doesn't mean that much. I actually, there are people on, and this is my follower account from Twitter. There are people on Twitter who have follower accounts of 5,000 people, no, actually 50,000 people or more. That really doesn't mean anything because if all those are like the Britney porno followers and spammers. Uh, that doesn't mean much. But also, it's not even just the number of followers, but it's also the quality of who those followers are. So for example, um, I actually did an experiment earlier this year, which I'll get to. I took out an ad on Facebook to acquire followers on Twitter. It cost me approximately a dollar to two dollars per follower that I earned. They were high quality because they wouldn't have clicked on my ad if they weren't, it said like, are you into anime or are you a science fiction fan? So they were high quality in the fact that they were qualified into what I was doing. But there was one problem. They were all Facebook people. So they were establishing their Twitter accounts for the first time. They didn't have any icons. They'd maybe done two or three tweets. They only had two or three friends. So those people, even though they were they were like, the spammers are here, and the get rich guys are there, these people were here. But the people sometimes you want are high quality people who could really have a conversation. So, and the other thing
thing is also your ability to listen is very, especially on Twitter. And by the way, Twitter is one of many services. Don't just think of that as you know the main thing. There are new services coming out all the time, so don't feel like you have to you know become a Twitter star overnight. It's actually the strength is in having followers on multiple platforms, which brings me to my next point. Um, you've got to own your own audience. You have to have your own hub. Um, here's the little monopoly guy, and that's actually a very good point. The, the problem you're going to find with Twitter or any of these services is you do not own them. And the problem is, like, for example, let's take an extreme example. You're an Ashton Kushner. You spent, he actually spent money putting up billboards and then going on CNN to get all of those followers. There's one problem with that list, and if you're a Hollywood executive, you see you're thinking the same thing, which is you do not own that list. If Twitter just snaps their finger and decides that they don't like you, all your followers are gone overnight. And I'll give you several concrete examples of this in the real world. Michael Arrington is the publisher of TechCrunch. He's probably one of the best tech writers out there. He came across a scoop a few months ago, or not that long ago, where he discovered some insider papers from Twitter. And being a good publisher with a really good instinct, he decided to publish them. He was, up to that point, on the preferred list of Twitter followers, like that you should follow this guy. Mysteriously, after he published this, or not so mysteriously, they dropped him from that list. They took the guy from Mashable, and if you saw a graph of the two, the guy from Mashable has been doing this, and Mike Arrington, who's actually pretty much as good of a better writer, is still kind of flatlined. And the problem is for both of them, though, that the Mashable guy isn't set for life because Twitter could next week decide that uh, Demi Moore is a better choice than you know the Mashable guy. So you don't own, you have to own your audience. You have to have, pe have people coming from these various outer points to your hub. Uh, your hub should be a domain that you own, preferably one that should have your own name on it. I do have michaelpinto.com, but I have several other hubs. Um, but there should be a point that you come back. The other thing is also, other services could be very fickle. For example, uh, I have a friend who's an adult photographer, and they happen to put some photos on Flickr, and some crazy religious nutcase complained about it, that person, after she invested a little bit over a year of her time uploading all of her images, gathering this great community of people who were just dying to see her photos, she had to start from scratch all over again. And that's kind of the lesson of, you've got to own your own hub. If she had her own website where she was pushing people from either Twitter, Flickr, MySpace, to her website, it's very dangerous these platforms change all the time, they get dated. Um, there's what's known as a social graph, which is your network of friends. And the problem is when you have that network of friends on Facebook or Flickr or Twitter, those services, and they make all their money, they own your social graph. So what you've got to do is, and the other thing is also, when you're hanging out spending all of your time on those services, you're making money for that platform. So you want to be able to drive people back to your site. I'll give you even like kind of a basic example. I had a writer who was doing work for me this summer, and here you are, you're on fanboy.com. You might not get, it's not the biggest way, it's not TechCrunch, but there are enough people reading it. So what I do for all my writers is I always give them a chance at the bottom about me, and it's you know usually, uh, you know, Joe Schmo is a writer, blah, 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 and I always give them the opportunity to think back to their own site. He's in college. He did not have his own site. He quickly made up a Twitter account, but he, he should have had that site to capture those followers from that exposure. And the other thing is also, fame is kind of a fickle thing. You may wander into the spotlight accidentally. If you do, you want to be able to send people back to your site and somehow take advantage of it. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you so much, Michael. <laughs> so, my portion is a little sillier than uh, Michael's portion, and it's how to learn how to become famous on the internet by looking at uh, Kanye West, who is in the news recently, I heard. Just once or twice. Just once or twice. I'm sorry, I'm going to let you go on with your panel in just a second, but first <laughs> i got to say... <laughs> I wish I, was, I wish I had helped you plan that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so 